This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Guys, welcome back to the Prince of Investment live right here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Thank you guys for tuning in all across the globe. This is episode number 11, and we still haven't gotten canceled. Ain't that great? But anyway, guys, as always, guys, don't forget to, you know, hit the like, subscribe, comment, share button, all the other great stuff. Thank you guys for tuning in to the show and all the great things that we've done across the globe. But as always, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump straight into it. So, as we always talk, you know, this is a financial literacy show. Have we done over the episodes where we talk different topics ranging from uh, investing to insurance to stocks, business, all the other great stuff. But today I have a very, very, very special guest calling in from all the way from D.C. Her name is Miss Angela Rich. She's done so many great things in philanthropy to all in financial literacy. I let her, she had to tell a lot of this stuff. But I know one of the keynote things that we saw was by her uh, being on the Forbes, you know, mentioning by Forbes as being possibly the next Steve Jobs. I think that's pretty awesome to have a minority female have that type of title and prestige, but she has a long, long history. And without further ado, guys, Miss Angela Rich. How you doing, Miss Rich? Hi, I'm doing great. Um, thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. So the people out there who don't know who Miss Angela Rich is, tell them who you are. Well, I'm not quite sure who Angela Rich is. Angel, Angel. I'm Angel. The one I'm sorry. Angel Rich. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Angel. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, basically Angel Rich is a little girl that's fourth generation Washingtonian um, mm -hmm. from D.C. that grew up to have a passion for financial literacy and became the next Steve Jobs. So I'm very excited to uh, share this story and journey with you all. Okay, awesome. So how did you, you know, being this little girl from D.C., how did you get into, I know you had this, this history of your family being into, uh, you know, like insurance, if I'm not mistaken. But what yes. made you take financial literacy by, you know, what made you think it's so important? What made you just, you know, out of all the things you could have done and all the great accolades that you have, what made you take financial literacy? having grown up traveling around the country, hearing different pleas from various different walks of life, I always wondered why people couldn't manage their money. Mm -hmm. And so it embedded a passion within me to figure out different programming to help people better understand how to manage their money. And as I grew older, I realized that that was actually financial literacy. I didn't know exactly how I would go about implementing it in my life, but I knew that I wanted to have my legacy um, be financial literacy in some type of way. Okay. Awesome. Now that you said that you grew up with a family of financial literacy and that you know how it was taught and how you figured out a way to uh, do things like that, I saw that, you know, you raised over, what, $200,000 for this app for teaching financial literacy. You know, could you tell us about the app? Yeah, so essentially it's similar to Candy Crush. Mm -hmm. But instead of swapping around candy, you're swapping around credit types mm -hmm. to be able to pay off your debt, achieve a high credit score, and learn from the multiple choice questions. So it's basically a almost um, – tricky way of teaching people how to manage their credit. The different pieces that you're swapping around represent the Fair Avid Credit Reporting System, so you're learning the components that go into the actual scoring um, of your credit score, if you will. And so we've been named the best financial literacy product on the market by the White House Department of Education, as well as J.P. Morgan Chase. And recently, we was named one of the top 10 apps in the world by Google and have been adopted into their top 50 apps department. Not, that is so amazing. So, Ms. Uh, Ms. Rich, how old are you right now? If you don't mind me asking, I know that may be, you know, a personal question. <laughs> I'm, I'm 30. Look at that, right? Uh, and, and the reason why I ask that, you know, I know that you're a, a young lady, but I wanted to just say, you know, a young African-American woman, young black woman who has uh, grown up and done something in technology. And what's the name of the app that, that you just mentioned? It's Credit Stacker. Credit Stacker. And so it's free. Yeah. 
Credit Stack and it's on app. It's on the uh, Apple Store and Google Store. Yeah, it's on both. Yeah. Okay, so everybody out there, parents, it's a good thing. I'm, I'm guessing for parents, school teachers, and stuff like that, Credit Stacker that you can download and help teach kids about financial literacy and financial education. And that was amazing yeah, how, and it's you know. available on um, phones as well as tablets and wearables. Wow, okay, great, great. And I like the concept where you took Candy Crush because it's like putting medicine in the candy, right? You know, you kind of, you know, you, you make exactly. candy, so you kind of put a little medicine in it so it's, it's not dry. Because I know financial literacy could be pretty dry. So now, my next thing is that you said about growing up with a family around insurance, right? How do you think insurance plays a role into financial literacy? I think that insurance is the foundation of financial literacy. Mm. It is literally the most um, risk-sensitive financial product that you can buy. The only thing more or less risk-sensitive than insurance is cash. Mm. And so, um, basically, once you get a certain amount of cash, or even just a little bit of cash, the next best step is a life insurance policy. You actually can save more in a life insurance policy than you can a bank account. So immediately after somebody, you know, they have the cash and they have this bank account, the uh, the the next step is to buy a life insurance policy. Okay, and. I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because, you know, when you think about the world of investing, most people think of, you know, real estate, maybe business. Some people think of stocks, bonds, and stuff like that, which are all great products. But it's like insurance seems to be this hidden gem that a lot of people don't know about. And I know that you came from a family line of insurance. Why do you think that is? You know, actually, this is the first time I'm saying this, but I just thought of it, and I should write it down. Send me a <laughs> Of this. <laughs> but insurance is sort of like sprinklers to me. Okay. What do I mean by that? I'm mm -hmm. sitting here looking at my yard right now that I recently redid and I have sprinklers outside. Mm -hmm. When I was a little girl, I felt like sprinklers was only for rich people with big yards. I felt like my yard wasn't big enough and we didn't have enough money to be able to afford sprinklers. Recently, when I redid my yard and I went to Home Depot, I literally bought this sprinkler for $3. The mm. entire time, it was not only accessible, it was already, it was also affordable. I just didn't know because of the perception that I had around sprinklers. And so I feel like insurance is like that. The people that we see receiving insurance, we conclude that it's for those people. And without even checking or verifying for ourselves, we say that it's something that is not applicable to us and, and that we can't relate to it. And we wait until we feel as though we've reached a certain age or financial status to even look into it, and by that time it's too late, and the premium amount and the health care requirements are too expensive. So I think having better education at younger ages about what things are available to us and would actually help to enhance our lives are conversations that we should be having more of. That is, you, I wrote all that down too, by the way. I got it all meant to note it. That was a great one that you, you know, uh, because you, when you use insurance with sprinkler systems, I thought, when I thought of investing as a, you know, I'm from, originally from Georgia, right? And being from a small town, when I always heard the word of, of investing, I thought, oh, you got to be rich. You know, that's for rich people. You know, right. we're barely getting by every day, or we're just a little bit over, you know, you know, um, Getting, you know, getting a bills paid, so you think, oh, that's investing, that's for rich people. So you don't even look that way. So you kind of think that's out of my league. Maybe one day when I'm rich or I have, you know, rich problems, then I think about investing. But then, like you said, when you when you look and you learn, you say, wow, I can get an insurance policy for this cheap. And one of the things is, what is the question I want to say? How does insurance, like you said, it's the foundation of a financial plan. How does insurance play a role into generational wealth? Well, you know, that is that is a very easy answer. The okay. number one way that other races have been able to come up over time is mm -hmm. through life insurance and passing down that wealth. When somebody dies in other races, the family wealth increases because they just received insurance and an inheritance. In the black family, it usually either stays the same or actually decreases, and we have to put up a GoFundMe to even pay for the funeral. So not only does insurance help with immediate financial costs, it helps to elevate the entire family over decades of time and over over eras of time, if you 
will. Hundreds of periods of years. It's done properly. Let's say, you know, I decide right now to have a million dollar policy and I pass that down to my kids. My kids automatically are millionaires. Once they receive the policy, they're then able to invest that money. They then have a million dollar policy or a two million dollar policy and it continues to snowball. So a hundred years from now, we're billionaires just off of life insurance. If we did nothing else but kept investing in life insurance. And so I, I don't think that people realize how easy it is to actually formate that snowball and to get it going. Okay. Now, that's very true. And the reason why I asked that question, I said, hey, you know, I don't want people to always hear me say it over and over like I'm beating a dead horse. I like to hear other people say it and get their perspectives on it as well. Now, another thing you, I, you mentioned earlier when you said, when you looked at the world of investing, you said, hey, insurance is like one of the most risk sensitive. Can you explain that to somebody who says, what does she mean by risk sensitive? Yes. Yeah, so whenever I teach people about financial literacy, I start by having them draw a line on a sheet of paper, and everybody always looks at me like, where the heck is she going with this? I thought she was supposed to be smart. Mm -hmm. And I say, draw a line on the sheet of paper. On one end, I want you to write risk sensitive. On the other end, I want you to write risky. And basically what risk sensitive means is you are sensitive to risk. You are allergic to losing, uh, losing bets, basically. Mm -hmm. And so when you decide to do something, you want it to be as de-risk, as low risk as possible, where it's pretty much a guarantee that it's going to work out. And on the opposite end, you have something that's extremely risky, like Bitcoin or just straight up shooting the lottery or mm -hmm. gambling, different things like that. And so basically it's important for people to understand their risk tolerance before entering into financial agreements and purchasing financial products because you may find yourself in an agreement or have purchased a product that is actually above your risk level. And so you, you have to be conscious of that because when times get rough, you might end up pulling out money or making um, unwise decisions that you wouldn't have normally made if you had invested at your appropriate risk level. So at a minimum, everyone should be interested in life insurance because there is no drawback. I would love to have a debate with somebody that tells me the reason they should not have life insurance. And so I think that um, at a minimum that that is important and to, to understand your risk sensitivity. Awesome. That's a great way you explain that. So I want to make sure everybody out there understood about the risk sensitivity. Now, another question for you, since you said about life insurance and how it passes down and stuff like that, and, you know, financial literacy and your app, Credit Stacker, you also written books before, right? Yes. How many books have you written? It was I know you've written one at least. Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I have written one book, and I've written a ton of research studies that okay. – uh, I've written two books, but I've only published one. Got it, got and so, it. Um, and so the other one is sort of a curriculum, if you will. So we have the Wealthy Life uh, Financial Literacy Curriculum, which is a textbook. I guess it's good. Well, technically, yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so so we, I've written a textbook and I've written a book. History of the Black Dollar, some people argue that that is also a textbook. Um, I'm a nerd. I can't help but write in textbook style. Mm -hmm. And so uh, History of the Black Dollar goes from slavery to present day and takes people on an economic journey and explains the contributions that blacks have made to America to mm -hmm. make it the capitalistic society that it is today. And so that is actually my pride and joy. Um, the foreword was written by Dahlia Ma Dr. Maya Rocky Moore, mm. um, Elijah Cummings' wife. I just okay. got my first box of them uh, yesterday, awesome. and I am so excited to kick off a tour with this book in February with uh, Representative uh, John uh, Lewis, awesome. who marched with Martin Luther King, and I just got, I just received that honor last week, and I'm kicking off at the uh, National African American Museum with him on February 12th at the Tell Them We Are Rising screening. So um, it's been a quite exciting journey writing it, and I look forward to sharing it and promoting it over the years to come now. When is this uh, book release? It was released on April 27th, earlier this year, 
Okay. Um, to the Congressional Black Caucus at the uh, Center for Global Policy Solutions Summit with Dr. Maya Rockmore. Okay, so the first two people to comment, you know, the first two comments that I see, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or whatnot, a podcast, have you maybe get this episode. The first two people to comment, we're going to purchase you two copies of her book, and we'll have them sent to wherever you're at around the world. So that's oh, it. Wow. Uh -huh. It's $25, and it's definitely a great read. Some schools are currently considering making it required reading. I definitely feel as though it should be required reading, and it is not your typical black history book or your typical economics book. It mm -hmm. definitely it creatively combines the two fields together to give you a, a holistic and complete perspective from the moment, from the first slave to present day as to what happened to the black dollar in our economic journey. Okay, awesome, awesome. So now out there, if you guys uh, want to follow Miss Rich, right? You know she has a app, Credit Stacker, which I'm definitely going to check out. Um, I know. Well, my producer is talking to my ear. He tell me got to take a break. So guys, uh, stay right here. Stay tuned to the Prince of Investing, and we'll be right back. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. Guys, and we are right back here live on the Prince of Investing, right here in the beautiful state of Honolulu, Hawaii. We have a, if you guys are just tuning in, we got Miss Angel Rich here on the line here. She's talking about her app, um, her, you know, her app that she launched called Credit Stacker, which is available on Apple and Google Play, and that is listed in the top 10 in Google, right? You know, it's done all this, I don't even know all the accolades, Forbes, Google, NASDAQ, all this other great stuff that she's been featured on. And she's talking about um, her new book, which she's getting ready to do on a, a book tour here with Congressman John Lewis, who we all know that's famous for Selma and uh, Bloody Sunday and stuff like that. So she's out here rocking and kicking. This young lady is doing her thing. Makes me feel bad about my life. But anyway, we're glad to have her here on the line. <laughs> uh, glad to have her here on the line here, sharing information and stuff like that and bringing it to you live. So she spoke about some great things. She spoke about how simple is investing and financial literacy, how just purchasing insurance, how far it will put you in, in advance of generational wealth. So another thing I wanted to bring up, right, when she talked about financial literacy, you know, being with children's financial literacy, parents that may be tuned in, what are some of the first steps you can say one could take, Ms. Rich? If I want to teach my kids. I would I'm, definitely emphasize reading. Okay. I don't think that parents spend enough time teaching their kids how to read. Mm -hmm. And when I bring this up as my first tip, people often almost get frustrated. Like, of course kids know, need to know how to read. Like, why is this the first financial tip? And one of the main reasons that I am as financially literate as I am and why others are when they become financially, financially literate is because they're able to read the finance books and understand the vernacular. And so to better equip your child to 
important that parents do that. Like, seriously, I would really like to see more of that. Secondly, mm -hmm. I think uh, giving stops on kids' birthdays and holidays can also be great. I think investing in high-risk growth stocks is a good one for their birthdays because it gives them 10 or 15 years to work out. And if you creatively choose them each year, it's highly likely that at least one of them will pay off for the long term and will have been a good investment um, for the child. In addition to that, a 529 plan is also good. It helps to, um, how do I say, uh, freeze the college tuition of a school that your child might potentially go to. Let's say everybody in your family went to Hampton, you're pretty sure your child is going to go to Hampton. You might as well go ahead and get a 529 plan on Hampton. Now, you don't have to send your child to Hampton. You can choose to go ahead and send it to Morgan. I mean, that's your problem if you choose to do that. It's like, nah, shout out to Morgan. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, if you choose to go to another school, you can do that. But for whatever school you wrote down at the year that you got the plan, it freezes the tuition of that school. And it helps for you to start putting money towards college tuition right now. And I actually think they may have even changed it where it applies to the whole state that you do it in, but don't quote me on that. So a 529 plan, reading books, stocks, and then as the child gets older, it's great to add them to good credit. Now, if you're not necessarily paying your bills on time, it's not so good to add them to your credit. But if you um, have a great credit score, it would be great to add your child to a credit card so that they can start to build credit um, once they uh, graduate uh, high school and college and different things like that. Okay. So some pretty great tips, right? Now, you just named out, hey, you know, start off by reading. Buying a particular growth stock. When she means by a growth stock, people are like, I don't know, what is a stock? She's speaking about probably one of your technology stocks, something like a, a Facebook or Apple or, you know, that has the potential to grow. They usually take a little bit more of a risk, but, you know, that's what she's speaking of. Usually a growth stock is something like a technology stock or something like that, right? So when you go into, she said, hey, get into a growth stock. Start reading, which is very important because if you can't read, then uh, you got some problems with understanding financial literacy, right? You have to be literate in order to be financial literate. So, and right. <laughs> you know that's a that's a pretty important step. Now, when you're doing these things, and you know you're speaking of some these are we live like right now today the stock market across the, the Dow Jones crossed a new high, over twenty three thousand points. This is the highest the stock market has ever been. We live in the richest country in the world. Stock market has over 22 trillion, not million, not billion, but trillion dollars in market capitalization. We live in the richest country in the world. The, the market has been roaring this year and last year, just for the last three or four years. And why do you think this is not taught as a child? Why did I understand, I didn't really start to understand what investing was until I was about 24, 25, and I was an early bird. I was an early bird when I started, like, hey, trying to figure this out. Why do you think, because my parents just taught me, hey, save your money, work and retire, and that's it. They didn't really understand it. Why do you think this is not taught at an early age? I think because most parents don't understand it themselves. Like, actually, I, I know that. Um, I don't know the exact statistic, but it's well over 80%. And it's 69% of teachers don't feel adequate to teach financial literacy. And so you can't teach something you don't understand yourself. And I think oftentimes, even the parents that may do well financially, they hire a financial advisor. It's not because they knew what they were doing. Mm. It was because they reached a certain point, had enough money to, to hire someone. And if that advisor didn't have their best interest or didn't know what they were doing, they were also messed up in the long run. So mm. there's, there, was, there has been less and less people over the past hundred years that has understood how to actually manage the stock market. And there was never a lot of them to begin with. But the conversation has become even more privatized over the years as um, this sort of wealth gap expands and you have less at the top and even more at the bottom. So the information continues to circulate and remain at the top and not filter down to the bottom. So it's just a matter of parents taking that step to educate themselves and bring the kids into the conversation along with them. And we can all grow together and learn together as a family 
youngest. Very true. And the thing is, when you hit someone at a young age, right, you are, like, I don't expect to, when I go teach kids, I don't expect them to, like, understand what credit is once they walk out of there and understand investing. It's just you're planting these little seeds. Because think about it. I'm 33 years, I just turned 33 years old. And one of the things, I can still hear my mother's voice from when I was 5 or 10 that I didn't understand at the time, that didn't make sense. But now, today, I'm like, wow, that makes perfect sense. So sometimes it's not about, hey, I want to, my kid to come in here and just play the stock market and be the next genius or anything like that. Sometimes it's just about planting those little seeds. And I don't want to make my son a trillionaire or whatever the case may be. I want him to have a better situation than I had. And then all I want him to do is financially to create a better situation than he had. And then my grandchildren to create a better situation and go on like that. So some people say, I don't, have a lot, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of time and stuff like that. How can I do it? It's just that taking that little money and giving your kids just a tad bit better situation than you had when you graduated college. Even if it's $1,000. Hey, when I graduated high school, I had zero. But my son has 1000 Then your son takes it and he does something. So that's the, the whole point of it. But now we're coming to the end of the show. And... Ms. Rich, I wanted to, you know, I know you got your app, Credit Stacker. I will be downloading that and checking that out here um, after, this, you know, after the show is over. So go out and check out the free app that she has that encourages and helps with financial literacy. Uh, she has her book. Like I told you, the first two people to comment here, you know, you will get a free copy. Don't text me. Don't call me. Just comment here so I can see it. It's in the public. You send me your address, and you'll get the book out to you wherever you're at around the globe. Second thing is... What we also want people to do as well is to, if you want to get in contact with me, Rich, I'll let her explain all that other good stuff. But support her, look out for her, and I, and I really like what she's doing. This is a young lady doing phenomenal things, you know, Congress, you know, White House, all the other great stuff. But before we get out of here, Ms. Rich, is there anything that you want to leave? And how, if people want to get in contact with you, all the other great stuff like that, what would you like to say to them? Okay, awesome, awesome. And is there anything else you want to mention about your book? I know it's on Amazon. Is it just hardcover paperback? Is there audio and ebook, or is it just, you know? Yes, there is an ebook and okay. there's uh, a hard, uh, hard copy. And we're thinking about doing audio. I said if I got 10 requests for it, so that just made my six. Okay. So um, we'll see. <laughs> I don't know. But, awesome. Uh, there's definitely ebook and hard copy already out there. It's been doing quite well. We've been getting a lot of great feedback on it. Great, great, Ms. Rich. Thank you for stopping by and taking the time. As always, guys, this is the Prince of Investment, Episode 11. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Thank you guys for tuning in each and every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Hawaii time. Until the next video podcast, whatever you see me do crazy around the globe, peace, be safe, I'm out, and thank you.